Interstate 180 is a junior high and high school youth ministry that meets every Tuesday and is comprised of multiple churches of different denominations in the Dixon, California area. Our vision is for unity within the body of Christ and that true salvation and life change would come to the youth in our area. Weekly podcasts can all be found here on our YouTube channel and are all free for download. And if you'd like more information about our ministry, please visit our Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram at Interstate 180. As promised, we are starting a new book tonight. Uh, it is the book of First John. I apologize. I was going to do like a little bit of an introduction of what the book, like who the author is, and a little bit about the time. But I'll be honest, you guys, when I began uh, kind of preparing my message, um, I just wanted to put as much time on the scripture as possible. Uh, so I don't know if Luke's going to come back next week and maybe revisit that. Uh, but basically, for the sake of tonight, um, know that this was written by a, a guy named John. And we'll maybe find out more about John later. Again, I apologize. I plan on maybe spending five minutes on that. Um, but again, I just felt like I needed to just get into the scripture tonight. Um, but we're only going to do the first four verses. Um, we're only going to do the first four verses of, the book, of book First John. Uh, if you're looking for where it is, uh, it's really towards the back. Um, first, first John, Second John, Third John, then Revelations. So it's at the very end of your Bible. But I'm only going to do, I'm only going to do the intro tonight um, because something really profound kind of struck me. One, I was thinking like, oh man, if I do the whole thing, I'm going to do the, like the first whole chapter and then some. You know, there's no way I can do this. But there was just something that was just really sticking out to me about the introduction to the book of First John, and I just kind of got floored by it. Um, I know we do a lot of praying around here. I'm, I'm going to pray again, and then, and then we're going to get into it. Father, I just ask it right now. God, you would just um, use me, God, that you would just uh, use my lips, my vocal cords, God, uh, my mind. <laughs> That's challenging. Um, God, my heart, uh, God, to just present your word, Father. Um, I mean, we're just, we're just vessels, God. We're instruments in the Redeemer's hands. So God, we give you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight we're going to be looking a little bit about who Jesus is. Um, to the Christian, Jesus is everything. If you take Jesus out of Christian, you don't really have anything. Um, I mean, Christian itself, when the word was really forged, was kind of a slur. It was an insult to Christians. Uh, the word Christian is really only found a, f- a few times in the Bible. The word disciples found many, 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 many times. Regardless, that, that doesn't really matter for the sake of tonight. It matters, but for the sake of tonight, we're looking at Jesus, who Jesus is. Is. We're going to look at, a, a, I think I have six statements of Jesus is. Um, so open up to the book of 1 John. If you're not there, chapter 1, we're going to do just the first four verses. And it reads like this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship with us. In our fellowship with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, we write this to you to you to make our joy complete. That's all we're reading out of 1 John tonight. Anything profound stick out to you? Maybe not. It took me a while. It took me a while for this to really jump out at me. If you guys have read any of the letters of, the, I'm not scrolling through Instagram. This happens to me every time. I forget to set the display on my phone to something longer. Because I actually have notes tonight. Again, I usually don't normally have notes. But here I am again with notes because I have all these scriptures to go to. We're going to go to a couple other books tonight. There we go. Um, did anything profound stick out to you in that at all? I'll tell you, if you've been in church for any number of months, years, There really isn't anything all that profound or new. There's no new message in this. This is the same message that we've heard as a Christian. That from the very beginning, Jesus Christ was. From the very beginning, the plan for salvation was laid down. From the very beginning, God understood what it was going to take for us to be in a relationship with him. From the very beginning, we we, we understand these things. 1 John is no exception to any of the other letters that start out with the gospel message. From the very beginning of the first 
John, first chapter, is the gospel message. He starts out with the fundamental truth. He starts out with what we need to understand first and foremost. We're going to look at a couple of other places tonight. But I want to ask, why do you think John would start this book, the first four verses, essentially just explaining that without, Je- without Jesus, who cares? That from the, from the beginning, from what we've seen, from what we've heard, from what's been uh, said to you, it's all about Jesus. And a very wise person told me that the main things are the plain things, and plain things are the main things. That's just how Scripture works. That's how our life works. We tend to overcomplicate uh, theology. We tend to overcomplicate our lives. We tend to overcomplicate, uh, you know, things like uh, a psychological aware Christian or, you know, someone who kind of like sees uh, things from a philosophical standpoint. We tend to overcomplicate things because there are real dynamic and difficult truths for us to understand about God's creation because God is a very intuitive and intentional God and he created creation in a way that's very complex yet within patterns that repeat. So there are a lot of things about creation and the way that creation was created that's very complicated. But at the same time, like I said, those patterns continue. God is also a very simplistic God. As complex as he is, he's also very simplistic. And he definitely knows that we are humans are very simple. Very, very, very simple-minded, or at least we tend to be. Very complex in our spirit and in our heart and in our emotions and in our minds and in our bodies, very complex. But at the root of it all, simplicity is everything. At the core of the Christian belief is a simple, true belief. Not in an acknowledgement of the existence of a God, because the Bible says that even the demons believe in God. So, as we begin to understand more about this gospel, which, you're right, Isaiah, th- this book is all about just the gospel and salvation. It's just, it's just helping us understand more and more about salvation. It's very black and white. It's either this or it's this. Either you're this or you're this. And according to this letter, it's like, I'm sorry, there's just no in-between. Now, for some of you guys who are on the fence, and maybe you're here for the first time tonight, and maybe you've, you know, been in church for a while, and you kind of don't know where you are with God, I ask that you'd come back for the next few weeks, because it's going to get really, really interesting, and you're going to be really, really challenged, very challenged, actually. Even some of you in the room that would say and believe that you are a strong Christian, you are going to be very, very challenged, and I envy Luke for being able to give the message for the next couple weeks. Read ahead. John, uh, 1 John chapter 1 and 2, it's, it's very difficult to swallow. But he starts out with this very fundamental, very basic, basic truth. That he says, everything that was testified from the beginning, that life appeared. We have seen it and we testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which is with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, that you may also have fellowship with us and our fellowship with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. He is bringing this letter to the target audience, which also, by the way, is us, for us to understand that we may have fellowship with each other and fellowship with the Father and with the Son and with the Holy Spirit. When we say things like, it's not just a religion, it's a relationship, these are some of these scriptures that kind of back it up, where it's a fellowship, it's it's a dynamic relationship that involves each other. You can't do Christianity by yourself. You just can't do it. Although it's very you know, an easy thing to kind of fall into this sort of thing where I feel like, ah, it's just kind of, you know, me and God. But, but right here, and all throughout Scripture, it tells us that we need each other. We need this dynamic fellowship. But the first kind of statement of truth in this is Jesus is life. Jesus himself said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through the very basic truth that Jesus is the key. This is why when we're teaching Sunday school, the Sunday school answer is always Jesus, right? Now, as, as you know, dumb and lame as that seems to be, that's so key, you guys. From the very beginning, if you're going to be brought up in the way uh, of the Bible, you do need to understand that it's all about Jesus. It's not about you being better. It's about you and Jesus. It's about Jesus taking your place and you accepting that and you loving him and you following him and being in a a dynamic relationship with him, and and being in fellowship with him. Again, it's not about you bettering yourself, although that kind of comes secondary to being in a relationship with anyone that you love. You don't want to make yourself worse for someone that you love. If you have a boyfriend, girlfriend, you don't intentionally want to make yourself worse of a person. You know, hopefully— 
out of the love for this person, you want to keep yourself healthy emotionally. You want to keep yourself uh, healthy physically and mentally so that you can give uh, your boyfriend, girlfriend, your, your mom, your, your dad, or your best friend the best of who you have, right? But what happens as Christians is we tend to make that primary. We tend to make this whole betterance of ourselves primary. But that's not what Scripture says from the beginning of this book. And from the beginning of several books, it lays it out for us. Jesus is life. Your righteousness isn't life. Your betterance is not life. Your righteousness and your betterance come secondary as a result of you living in the fellowship with Christ. And so if you're here tonight and, and, and a good chunk of your Christian life is about sin control or, or sin management, and I'm not saying that's a bad place to be because that's good because you acknowledge that sin is a problem, but I want to challenge you to read into some of these fundamental truths because we kind of tend to reject the gospel for the sake that it's too simple. It's too easy. It's, 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 too, it's too basic. And I've heard it before, the Easter story and the Christmas story. It's, you know, it's old bread. I'm telling you guys, it's the, it's the core. This is the meat and potatoes. This is the absolute core of the Bible, the gospel message. And he sums it up here in four verses. Now go over to John chapter 1, uh, if, if you would follow me there. Um, it's it's uh, a little bit to the left here. Uh, you go to the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, it's the fourth fourth book of the New Testament, fourth gospel. And um, we're going to look at a little, uh, another intro. Another intro, and, and this, is, this is written after Jesus has raised, uh, and the church is now growing. The church is fulfilling the call that God has given them and to us, the Great Commission, that's found in Matthew 28, 18 and 20, where you know, go out and make disciples, baptize them, teach them, and I am with you. So this is a, a result of that. Um, they're going out into the world, into the nations, and preaching the gospel. And, and this is one of the truths that is written. Another, uh, another introduction here. Uh, John chapter 1. We're going to read a few verses out of there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of man. The light shines into the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. He says, in the beginning was the word. How weird is that? How interesting and complex is that? But at the same time, it's incredibly simple. In the beginning was the word. This right here. The word of God. The word that he entrusted Jesus with. Why? Because we find out here a little bit down that in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. The word was in the beginning. The word was with God in the beginning. The word was God. God became flesh. The Word became flesh. In the beginning, Jesus was. In the beginning, the Word was. So one of, these, one of these statements that you could say is that Jesus is the Word. And when Jesus said that I, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law, once again, he is, he is showing us that he is the Word. He's showing us what the Word is. He's speaking to us the Word. And the Word is simply this, the words of God that he wanted us to understand, that he wanted us to know about him. If you have a, a best friend, again, or a boyfriend or girlfriend, someday when you get married, you might send each other love notes. You might send each other, like, morning texts, you know, and, like, those are, like, you know, really sweet. And, you know, there, there are things that you may treasure, keep in a little box, you know, love notes. Oh, I can't remember, you know, when we, we wrote each other that note 10 years ago and look how much we've grown. Like, like there's something sentimental about words that last, huh? It's kind of cool because this has lasted from the beginning of man. This is the love letter that God wrote to us. Jesus came to fulfill the word, the words within this book. And he spoke the words that are in this book. Because it says in verse 14 that the word became flesh. Jesus, God, became flesh so that he could die for our sins. Again, another book that begins with the importance of the gospel. Go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 1. 
You guys are going to get blisters flipping around through all the scripture. Only one more after this one. Revelation, last book of the Bible. We're going to start at verse 4. Yes, chapter 1, verse 4. You're going to find this thing here, this, this weird pattern, if you guys are seeing it, of a name that keeps popping up. It's not Jesus. There's another name that keeps popping up. If you're trying to figure out who that is, just wait two seconds. Verse 4. John. <laughs> seeing a pattern? This is good. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you, who from him, uh, I'm sorry, to you from him who is and who was and who is to come from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is faithful, who is a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us, who has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be, uh, uh, to be a kingdom and priest to serve his, um, serve his God and Father. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Last verse. Look, he is, coming, uh, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who, uh, even those who pierced him. That's so tight. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. Or shall it be amen? I'm sorry, last verse. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. Are you guys seeing a pattern with this introduction? Anything popping out more than once? Jesus. Thank you, Isaiah. Jesus keeps popping up. More than that, the gospel message keeps popping up. That God, Jesus, sent Jesus, who was God. Figure that one out. I have yet to figure that one out. And I'm your youth pastor. I don't think I'll ever figure out in this brain because my brain doesn't really function well anyway, and I don't think any of you guys are ever going to figure that out until we're out of these bodies. But God, who is Jesus, it says in John chapter 1 that the Word was God, the Word was with God, and, the, and then the Word became flesh. Jesus, the Word, is God, equals, 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 equals all around, and every person who's in math right now is just exploding because it just doesn't make any sense. That's supernatural. That's why it's awesome. Because it's not natural. It's supernatural. It's really, really cool, and it doesn't make any sense at all. In verse 8, it says, I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. Anyone know what that means? The beginning and the end. I am the first and the last. So statements of truth, Jesus is first. Jesus is last. He's the bread of the sandwich. He's the first. He's the last. And Jesus is God. We're seeing all of these very basic, fundamental truths at the beginning of all of these letters. Why do we keep seeing this at the beginning of these letters? Because the importance of the gospel is first. It is primary. If you're here tonight and you're a Christian, you have to know this. You have to understand this. More than it being in your brain, you guys, this has to be the core of our life. When we do not have the gospel at the core of our life, we turn into sin managers. Not only with ourselves, but with other people. We become judgmental. We become hypocrites. We become maybe heresies. Heretics, heresies, <laughs> walking heresies. That's what we turn into. Because when you take Christ out of Christian, you're just Ian. I don't think Ian's in the room tonight, is he? Okay, good. Ian is not here. All right, dang, I kind of wish he was here. <laughs> when you take Christ out of the gospel, you have taken the power out of the Bible. You've taken the power out of God in your life. You've taken the power of the Holy Spirit and its fruit out of your life. Because this is not a self-help book, you guys. There's a lot of really good self-help books out there that are on the shelves. I'm sure you could go through New York Times bestsellers over the last couple years and find a couple really good self-help books. But I'm telling you, this is not this. This is a lot more than that. This is not a self-help book. This is a new 
self book. Dang, it was so good. I don't come up with this stuff, by the way. All this stuff is ripped off from other people or just in the moment, all right? I'm not like, like, it's just so good. Why? Because it's just true. (laughs) This is new self. Romans tells us that we will be new creations. When we come into a true and authentic relationship with Jesus Christ, when we accept that gospel, we begin to live out that gospel. I want to turn to one other passage here. You can turn there if you want. Uh, It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is not written by John. This is written by Paul. If you want to turn there, go for it. 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 15. And um, I think it's the first few verses. Yeah, 1 through 4. Something about this 1 through 4 business, it's pretty good. It's kind of like the 316s. All the 316s are great. And apparently all the 1 through 4s are also really great. The 1 through 4s are the, are the gospel verses. He says this, uh, if you're there, which by the way, if you guys don't have a Bible, take that one home. It's yours. Mark it up. I got a bunch of highlights in here. It's really nice. Mark it up, mark it up. Verse 1. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. Why would we need to be reminded, Paul? Because we're forgetful, because we turn back to ourselves, because we leave the gospel in the high. We, you know, we put Jesus back in the dirt. We put Jesus back on the cross. Jesus has resurrected, and he's alive, and he's in our lives. We have to be reminded of that, because we make it about ourselves, and we don't. Which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, not by your betterance, not by your righteousness. I keep, I keep hitting it because it always, it always comes back, and even I'm guilty of falling back into that pattern. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. And that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to scriptures. He passes on to us as first importance. Not like, okay, let's, you know, let's get together and just kind of nail the obvious and then move on to something deeper. No, 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 no. First importance. Most important. Anytime a team wins a Super Bowl, they are the most important team that year. Anytime a team wins the World Series, they are the most important team that year. The gospel is the most important message every single year that you live on this earth. There's no point in your Christian life where you level up into this new spiritual highness, into this new religious status, into this super Christian, to where the gospel is no longer the, the floor, that you step into this new ceiling to where it's like, oh, well, now it's really about this. I've, I, mean, I mean, I've really matured, and so now I understand, you know, the gospel, so now we can move on to something deeper. No. First, importance. Number one, primary, the foundation. First, importance. But then look at what he says, that according to scriptures— Christ died for our sins. And then he was raised according to scriptures. The basis that he goes to for the proof of the gospel message is not historical texts, but biblical texts, scriptural texts, the scriptures, the Bible. He puts the most important thing in our life if you're a Christian, within the pages of this book. Does that make this the most important thing? You tell me. I can tell you, though, for sure that the gospel message itself is not secondary. It's not third and dare. It's not tertiary. It's not, you know, you start down here and you build up on it and then you forget about it. No. If the building, a big tall skyscraper, forgets that its foundation exists, it's still there. But if you take the foundation out of the skyscraper, what happens? A lot of people die, and a lot of money gets wasted. In San Francisco, we're not too far away. San Andreas Fault runs through there. Hayward Fault runs near it. There's been some big earthquakes out there, and they're constantly revising their, uh, their laws for structural integrity. 
for buildings, bridges, skyscrapers, even houses. And what they did um, after the Loma Prieta quake is uh, they did an, uh, another uh, revising of it. And the, the USGS has become the, the more, more involved in these laws. They're, as more science is understood about earthquakes, they're, they're passing more laws. They recently did the Bay Bridge. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever go to San Francisco, but if you've been through there, it's a beautiful, beautiful bridge. Not because they wanted to make a prettier bridge, but because they realized that if there was another really big earthquake like San Andreas or the Hayward Fault up in the six, sevens, eights, like we could see a really big disaster. So they got rid of the old one and they put in the new. They didn't adapt to it. They got rid of the old one and they put in the new one. For some of the houses that weren't up to code, they got rid of them and they put in a new one. Really, really cool devices where you put the major beams of the houses on these, these oscillating sort of, sort of gimbal things where the entire house sits on an entire new foundation so that the earth can shake underneath it and the house is completely still. Old foundation out, new foundation in. If we lose the foundation, we will fall anytime there's a big earthquake in your life. And it doesn't even take a big earthquake. It really doesn't. Especially the longer you live. If you're an older building, you're made of masonry. <laughs> the older you are, if your foundation isn't fresh, you're going to be the first thing to go. Think about that. The older you get, the longer you walk with Christ, without Christ as your center, the more likely you are to fall. Because the more things you experience in this life, the more knowledge you obtain, the more wisdom you obtain. We're going through Ecclesiastes right now, the Bible study, we find out it grieves us. We understand more, and it grieves us. If you are not rooted in the gospel as first importance in your life, you will fall as a Christian. Guaranteed. Absolutely. Absolutely you will fall. Why? Because we find out, last statement of, uh, of, of truth in here, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that Jesus is salvation. Jesus is salvation. Later on, you keep reading, and, and Paul says that if, I mean, if Jesus Christ didn't rise, we're all believing something that's just completely false, and we're, we're all believing in vain. I mean, every single one of us. We're just, there's no point. We might as well just go off and just do whatever we want. Jesus is everything. So we're going to break out in small groups here in a second, but I, I, want to, I want to post something to you. Do you guys know how important first impressions are? For you guys in the room, if you guys are dating, the first time that you met your soon-to-be possible, maybe a hope-so girlfriend's dad, was that maybe a little bit intimidating, some of you guys? I can tell you the first time was absolutely frightening because I actually knew what was coming, that I had to, like, tell him, like, my favorite Bible verse and all this stuff, so I, like, recited this, like, speech. And, yeah, it was, it was still really intimidating. He was a very, he goes to my church. He's awesome. He, he's a big man, too, so it was really intimidating. You know, and I was a tall high schooler, but, dude, that was scary. <laughs> that was really, really scary. I practiced what I told him, like, on the way there, I was in the car, it's my favorite, Romans 8, 28, blah, 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 blah. You know, and I'm like, I'm going through this because I knew how important first impressions are. If you guys have a friend that your first impression was like, oh, dude, that, that guy's really annoying. That guy, like, that's really, that's really pretty. And then, you, you know, they come around and be your friend. Like, you're their friend still. But you guys can go back and like, dude, I will never forget the first impression. Like, I always thought that you were just terrible. Like, I thought you were just really annoying and I did not like you. Like, when you talked, it was just bad. But now, like, you're my friend. I know, you get bumping elbows and looking at each other. We're all, we've all been there. First impressions stick with you, huh? The first impression that John is making with us, the target audience, first impression with these letters. Jesus Christ is salvation. He's the foundation. Jesus Christ is salvation. He's the foundation. Jesus Christ is salvation. He's, he's the foundation. You didn't hear it? Jesus Christ is salvation. Jesus Christ is foundation. If he's making the first impression to us as this, I ask you guys, especially if you guys are in school, which is all of you guys, what kind of impression are you making when you meet someone? 
What kind of impression are you making when you're out on the street, not at school? What kind of impression are you making at home? What kind of impression are you making with your friends on Xbox Live, PSN? What kind of impression are you making? I know, right? <laughs> what kind of impression? Because the first impression that Paul lays out, or I'm sorry, John lays out, is that it's about Jesus. That should be our first impression too. And I'm not talking about every single person you, you, know, you meet. Like, Hi, I'm Matt. Hi, I'm Matt. I should tell you about Jesus right now. Jesus Christ salvation, Jesus Christ foundation. Like, no, that's not exactly what I'm saying. That would be really great. And I might be able to like convert some people, but I think I'd also really, really scare a lot of people. <laughs> that's not what I'm telling you to do. But what I am telling you guys is, the Bible says, beautiful are the feet that carry the gospel. If you guys want the path where you go in your life to be beautiful, carry the gospel. You've got to carry it. It's got to be with you. Not just on your lips, but in your heart. Come out of your hands. Come out of your feet, you guys. The gospel is core. The gospel is center. I'm done talking. Let's split up into small groups. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to pray real quick. Father God, I thank you so much for the gospel. God, there's nothing that I can do to earn salvation. There's nothing that I can do uh, to earn your love, to earn your trust, to, to earn uh, uh, your, your favor and your blessings, God. There's nothing that I can do to, to level up. God, that you love us so much to the point that you would send your son to die for us in our stead. God, I, help, I, I pray that, that you help us understand that, God. God, it's, that's such a, a, a difficult thing to understand fully. God, help us to understand the first importance of the gospel and how it translates into our life. God, we give you the praise and the glory. We thank you again for your son, Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen.